Hi everyone, it's me, and today let's watch this video together. <laughs> Game exchange, culture shock. Uh, hey everyone, Gaijin Goomba here. Hi Gaijin Goomba. Uh, I hate this time of year. I know Sorry. we've had a couple of really great games come out so far, but nothing's worse than the gaming dry spell leading up to E3, especially Sorry. after that last Nintendo Direct. But it's not as bad as 2020 or 2021, isn't it? In comparison. You know the one. It just reminds me of being at E3 last year, man. All those great games that I couldn't wait to play and analyze. But the one thing that I had fawned after the most was none other than Mario Odyssey. And shocking, I know. I've only done like four videos on the game already. But something that you've got to understand about this Mario game is that it's got something that I have not seen Mario have in a very long time. Cultural diversity. Yeah. This wasn't just one level, it was the entire game. The hints of ancient Greek lore and architecture in the late kingdom. The unique take on the Big Apple during the 1950s with New Donk City. But the one kingdom that I've had my eye on for some time now was the one that I first experienced at E3 last year. The Sand Kingdom. Oh. Now I know what you're thinking, and yes, I do remember the controversy that surrounded this kingdom and Mario's costume associated with it. Never mind the fact that nearly all of Mario's outfits from Odyssey paid homage to appearances in other games, commercials, and products. So there's a difference between cultural appropriation, cultural inappropriation, um, um, paying homage to it, taking reference to it. People may, it's, it's how say, it's hard to, it's hard to explain simply for me to say that. But there was still a sufficient outcry that Mario's sombrero poncho combo and the stereotypical appearance of the Sand Kingdom's residents, the Toastarinans, was culturally insensitive. Hmm. When I saw, th tell me what, tell me what, interested. That I took that as a personal challenge. Was Nintendo being culturally insensitive with Odyssey, or was it a first step into something we've all been wanting Nintendo to do for years? Step outside of Japan. But the best <laughs> way to find out is to explore the connection between the fantasy world of Mario and the reality of Central and South American culture. Mm -hmm. To dig down into the details and see if Nintendo was just being lazy, or if they were doing their homework. With homework. the best place to start being the poster children of this kingdom, the Toastarinans. Yeah. These guys couldn't have been any simpler. The Toastarinans were obviously modeled after Calavera, Decorative skulls made of clay or sugar seen almost exclusively during the Mexican holiday Dia de Muertos, okay. a time when families would come together and honor their ancestry as their spirits would revisit the mortal world for a few days. Dia de Muertos is understood on nearly a global level for being uniquely Mexican, and it would be simple to just write off the Toastarinans as an overly simplistic way of trying to be culturally diversified. But it's not yeah. that simple. What a lot of people may not realize is that the holiday of Dia de Muertos is not a post-Columbian celebration. Huh? Revering the dead and the symbolism of the afterlife embodied in skulls and skeletons is actually a 3,000 year old practice. Wow! In ancient Central and South American cultures, human skulls were bleached, adorned with precious gems and metals, and displayed as art to remind the natives that death was a positive step into a higher form of life. That was the true inspiration behind the Toastarinans. And this is where I discovered that the Sand Kingdom wasn't a cheap shot at stereotypical Mexican culture but researched inspirations of Mezzo and South American culture that reached back as far as five millennia. Wow. Did you just say five millennia? Five thousand years. That's a long years of reference. You can't just say that culture is mine, mine alone, it's yours and yours alone. It's taking reference through years and years and years. Yeah. Case in point, look at the Toasterinan's counterparts, the Chincho. In game, the Chincho are undead, or undeader? Whatever, Undeader? versions of the Sand Kingdom's natives that will attack Mario in a zombie-like fashion. But oh. they're not zombies, are they? They're mummies. There's no mistake, they're wrapped up in bandages. Well, guess who else has mummies? South America. In fact, oh. their mummies predate their Egyptian counterparts by over 2,000 years. Wow. In Arica, a province of northern Chile, mummified remains of a pre-ceramic civilization known as the Chincholo people were discovered dating as far back as 5,000 BC. Wow. Almost 30% of the discovered mummies were naturally mummified, but the rest were done so by man-made methods, usually involving the removal of internal organs, skin, and flesh, and replaced with animal hair, vegetation fibers, and lots of clay. So Ooh. why is this so insane? Two reasons. One, there's not only a conceptual similarity between these two as they're both mummies, but a name similarity as well between the Chincho mummies of the Sand Kingdom and the Chinchoro mummies of South America. Two, location. The Sand Kingdom is a long stretching desert that has little cloud cover with rolling sand dunes and craggy mountains in the background. In comparison, the Chinchoro mummies were first discovered in Arica, but Arica is part of the driest, sandiest desert in the world, the Atacama Desert. Wow. That's unbelievable. I honestly got no idea 
Mm. Tell me more. Similar to the Sand Kingdom, the Atacama Desert is a plateau stretching over 40,000 miles comprised wow. mostly of sand dunes and rocky hills. Oh. It is also the driest place in the world with only 0.6 inches of rain per year, with locations like Arica getting even less. Heck, there's barely any cloud cover on any given day of the year. True. Going back to the Sand Kingdom, I have never seen it rain or even have any sort of overcast. But while the Atacama Desert may be the most H2O-deprived desert in the world, just like the Sand Kingdom, it has one notable oasis in the middle of its miles upon miles of sand dunes. The town of Huacachina. Huh. Home to 96 residents, Huacachina is a huge Peruvian tourist spot surrounded by lush palm trees and crisp waters that legends say have healing properties. In comparison, the desert oasis in the Sand Kingdom, though small, draws in a lot of tourism with its clear waters and thick palm trees. It even has its own section in the tourist brochure map screen. Living heart of the desert. That's great. But that still isn't all because another thing these two deserts have in common is bizarre winter weather. In July of 2011, a freak arctic cold front dumped 31 inches of snow into the plateau, causing all kinds of havoc to the flora, fauna, and people that live there. Wow. This has been the only time there has ever been an ice storm in the area. In turn, when Mari first visits the Sand Kingdom, the people are experiencing extreme cold weather that has never been seen before. Never. Unnatural frost has coins, structures, and even residents trapped in ice after Bowser stole the binding band from the inverted pyramid. This brings us to another fascinating connection between the Sand Kingdom and Central and South America. Hmm. Pyramids. In nice. Odyssey, the Sand Kingdom's inverted pyramid is almost impossible to miss as it floats above the eastern side of the map embroidered with supposedly hieroglyphs of the kingdom's ancient residents. Mm -hmm. What makes this stand out is that unlike Egyptians who built their pyramids exclusively as tombs to the elites like pharaohs, Mayans, Aztecs, and Olmecs built their pyramids as holy monuments. Pyramids to oh. these people served as a literal bridge between man and the heavens where their sacrifices and worship could be easier seen by the gods. Wait, do you just say sacrifice? Uh... Okay, times change and sometimes for the better. Many others though were created and specifically left untouched by mankind as it was designated a holy home to an individual deity. What? In the case of the Sand Kingdom, you can't get much closer to heaven or even more untouchable to the populace than being in the frickin' sky. And just <laughs> like the Central and South American pyramids, the Sand Kingdom's inverted pyramid is home to its own centralized deity and stage boss, Nuklotek. As a quick side note, looking at his original Japanese name, Achinyakami or Tostarinen God, there is more evidence that Nuklotek is the god of the Tostarinens rather than just a thematic boss. Oh. But what the heck is he based on? Well, good old Nuklotek is modeled lock, stock, and barrel from the ancient colossal heads created by the Olmec. 17 have been discovered to date, and each one was carved from a single basalt boulder. And given the fact that each head could weigh up to 20 tons and stand over 14 feet tall, carving these suckers took an insane amount of time. Mm -hmm. Which leads archaeologists to believe that they were carved after very important people. But while there are several artifacts relating to the Olmec culture of the 1500 BCs, little is actually known about these colossal heads as they were oftentimes discovered in seemingly random places. <laughs> There's been a lot of speculation whether these were the heads of gods, rulers, or even ballplayers given some of the Olmec headgear that they wear, but it's agreed that these massive monuments were at the very least modeled after great protectors and rulers of ancient Mesoamerica. Which mm -hmm. makes Nuklotek being a god and guardian to the Tostarinans all the more culturally legitimate. Even Jaxi, the hyperactive feline transport of the Sand Kingdom, has deep roots in Mesoamerican culture. Named from a simple hybrid of the words Jaguar and Taxi, Jaxi is actually more than just an unwieldy public transport. Wait, what? So, it's a Jaguar and a Taxi. Ja Java Taxi? Uh, Tagua? Mmm. He's one of the dozen or so ancient guardian statues come to life where the rest of his so-called family remains in their statue state. Huh. This is where things get interesting because jaguars were everything in Mesoamerica. They were considered avatars of Tezcatlipoca, one of the central deities in the Aztec pantheon. Huh. They were considered unique creatures with the ability to move between the mortal and spirit world at will considering their ability to hunt night and day, living in comfort on the ground or in the nocturnal animals. Trees. It was said that when a jaguar died, so too did a human die alongside it. Wow. But most interesting of all are the many different were jaguar statues found in old Olmec territories. These statues represented Nagwals, guardians and companions to Mesoamerican shaman who not only protected them from evil spirits, but also granted them protective passage and the ability to travel within the spirit realm. It might be a bit of a stretch, I admit, but the fact that Jaxi is a guardian statue come to life that grants Mario safe passage across all different kinds of hazards and has the sentience of a human yet ferocity of an animal, I think there might be some connection here. Finally, even the Moai habitat has some connection with ancient South American culture. 
In the Sand Kingdom, the Moai habitat is made of a small island only accessible by traveling across floating platforms, and with a name like the Moai habitat, it leaves the player with the feeling that this was designated a sanctioned area specifically for the Moais. Hmm. Funny thing about that is we're seeing the exact same thing happen in real life in the Chilean hmm. island known as Easter Island. For the longest time, the similarly named and similarly styled Moai statues have been the biggest pull of tourism for the island. However, in recent years, caretakers have been noticing the details of the carvings have begun to chip and fade. Ugh. And these are statues that have kept their luster after a thousand years of storms and weathering. So, mm, humans, why, why? Things that have withstood thousands of years of torture, of harsh conditions, and just a few years, humans, yeah. With 25,000 tourists visiting the island every year though, there's suspicion that mass human interaction with the statues are creating unnatural wear and tear. Thus, a massive conservational effort has been made under UNESCO to preserve the islands and its statuesque inhabitants. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar, right? Yeah. So why does this matter? What does it mean? Well, everything. Mm -hmm. For as long as the <clears throat> Switch has been alive, I've seen Nintendo go further and further in their game design using influences from more and more parts of the world. Breath of the Wild took beautiful inspiration of not only architecture, but character designs from Arabic culture. ARMS took a kooky fighting game concept and developed characters in stages not only of Japan, but of China, Latin America, and even France. And now Mario, one of the most protected and walled off properties Nintendo owns, has gone headfirst into multiculturalism, sending Mario into a literal worldwide journey. This not only makes for more inclusive games, but keeps these old formulas incredibly fresh at a time where some of the old Nintendo tropes were getting stale. At this point, there's no telling just how far Nintendo's gonna go with the Switch, whether it be True. hardware or software. But the one thing I am sure of is I couldn't be happier with the direction they're going. True. But thanks for watching, everyone. You. If you enjoyed this cultural romp in a Mario Odyssey, check out my two-part series I did on Bowser's Japan-inspired kingdom. I freaking died when I saw that for the first time, and yes, that is included in the video. Otherwise, if you enjoy what we do here on the Theorist channel, be sure to subscribe to never miss out on our newest scientific and cultural theories about the games we love. But until okay. next time everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that this video has been very inspirational, um, educational, and knowledge filled for you. It's, it's very educational for me. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. If you do like this video, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to my channel and comment down below if you have any share with us. Don't forget to follow my channel as well. And I sincerely appreciate all of your, all of your grateful words, all of your encouragement, all of your support for me. Thank you. Super grateful for it. And I hope to see you in my next video. Thank you. But hey, that's just a game. A game exchange! Culture shock. Thanks for watching. Thank you. And I'll see you in my next video. Thank you. Subscribe.